Hi everyone, this is Gina Mayo from Music in Our Homeschool, and I'm thrilled to be talking today about how to teach music the Charlotte Mason way. Now, if you have never heard of Charlotte Mason, I wanna start with just a quick introduction to her. I first heard about her method and Charlotte Mason from the book For the Children's Sake by Susan Schaefer McCauley. I read this book when my youngest kids were toddlers. My oldest kids were toddlers. I have eight children. They range now in ages 21 down to 10. And uh, so that was a long time ago that I first read this book and was blown away by the new ideas I read in it. Um, I'm previously a pr private um, public school music teacher. I went to college at Baylor, got my music education degree, and then taught for five years in the public school system, um, music, junior high choir, and then elementary general music. Um, and then moved to Illinois after I got pregnant with my first child. My husband lives up here, was from up here, so we wanted to move to Illinois to be near his family. And since then, I have been homeschooling. So that has been many, many years, and I still have three kids. Well, I just have three that have graduated, three that will be in homeschool high school next year then a middle schooler and an elementary school kid still to come. So Susan Schaefer McCauley, I love this book. Um, it was so wonderful and helping me understand a new way to teach my kids that the typical way I had learned about education in college and when I was teaching in the public schools is not the way that I wanted to do my own homeschool. So I have been inspired by Charlotte Mason's methods the entire time I've been homeschooling, which has been over 16 years. And I uh, would love to talk to you today, like to meld the two of Charlotte Mason with music, because music education is my passion. I love to help uh, other homeschool moms figure out how to include music in your homeschool. I know it's really hard when you don't have any expertise in it, if you don't have a background in music or how to teach music, um, but you want your kids to have music education, it's really tricky, I know, for a lot of homeschool moms to figure out how to do that. But doing it the Charlotte Mason way, I hope you will see by the end of this workshop, is not that difficult and it's actually very fun. So there are six aspects of how to teach music the Charlotte Mason way, and those are that we will talk about today, composer study, hymn study, folk song study, musical creativity, dancing, and living books about music. So before we get into those, I just very quickly wanna talk about a couple of Charlotte Mason's tenants. Um, that I have actually incorporated in my homeschool at various times. And one of those is to use living books. Living books are typically written by one author um, and they're very much more enjoyable to read than a dry textbook. So you can have living books for every subject, um, biographies and stories about animals that are living in the wild so that you can learn about science or um, books about the circumference books about math to learn more about math concepts. So there's living books for all kinds of subjects. Um, another definite method of idea that she encouraged us to do is nature study, to get out in nature and, and learn about the world that way. She encouraged artist study and Shakespeare, copyright, copy work, dictation and narration, short lessons, which is why I encourage short lessons for my music lessons, handicrafts, and then the things that we're going to be talking today related to music. Um, toward the end of the workshop, I will give you a link to a blog post that I have written that has links to pretty much everything I'm going to share today. So if you're wondering where you can find a particular resource or what was the name of that book, again, I will give you the link for that at the end of this workshop. So in the book, For the Children's Sake, Susan Schaefer McCauley said, music into the drab and hurried blur of breathless 
20th century life allow time and enjoyment and growth for this aspect of our humanness. So there's one reason why we need to include music in our homeschools. Um, Karen Andriola is another author that has inspired me and taught me a lot about the Charlotte Mason method. So Charlotte Mason was actually an, an educator from the um, 1800s in England. So she didn't homeschool, but she w did teach children. She was never married, didn't have children of her own, but taught children for many, many years. She helped governesses learn how to teach, and then she started helping moms um, teach their own children through her really revolutionary ideas back then. But I love what Karen Andriola did in this book, The Charlotte Mason Companion, because she took Charlotte Mason's ideas and made them more applicable for homeschooling, for homeschooling in the late 1900s and early 2000s. So at the beginning of this book, you can see that she divides it up into different subjects like, ooh, about to drop it, like um, living books and narration and spelling and grammar and music appreciation and Greek myths. So you can read a little bit about each of those types of subjects and how to do them the Charlotte Mason way. And she said, uh, actually it was Macaulay who said this, children respond to the very best music. Get Brahms, Bach, Beethoven, Elgar, and Mendelssohn records. Play one at a time to a three-year-old. Maybe the child will dance, clap, smile. Let the children beat drums or march. There is no need to start them off on a watery diet, a musically poor fare. Give them the best. Let a few works become friends. Then get good seats at a concert. Sit up close. See the child stare in wonder as the violinist plays and the conductor conducts and the choir sings. If you've taken care that at least one item on the program is familiar to the child already, you will probably feel an excited tug and hear, listen, they're playing our music. So that is a great thing to do. What I love about this quote is that Macaulay said she recommended starting with three-year-olds. Um, I would go even so far to say you can start when your children are babies or even when you're pregnant. One of the greatest loves I, my greatest loves is teaching early childhood music and movement classes to the preschoolers at my homeschool co-op. I include great classical music every week during class so that they can begin hearing this majestic music of the past. Sometimes they dance with scarves or at other times play simple musical instruments. And as the children get older, I encourage them to lie down with their eyes closed so they can better focus on the music and or I might even have them draw on a notebooking page what the music inspires them to draw. That's a type of narration. Mrs. McCauley went on to say, if we follow Charlotte Mason's principles, have music be a part of the life and atmosphere surrounding the young child, and it should be really good music. So if you have a question about what is really good music, let's get to that. So number one is composer study. Charlotte Mason wanted her students to be immersed in one composer's style at a time so that they could really begin to know his or her style. Many proponents of her method suggest taking one composer and listening to only that composer's music for an entire semester or maybe a term, which is a trimester, so that they are only learning about two or three composers per year. She said this, it is a pity that we like our music as our pictures and our poetry mixed so that there are few opportunities of going through as a listener a course of the works of a single composer. Let young people study as far as possible under one master until they have received some of this teaching and know its style. But there are some very easy ways to do composer study. So let's get some ideas from both Susan McCauley and Karen Andriola about how they did composer study when they were homeschooling their own children using the Charlotte Mason method. 
Mrs. McCauley said one day a week that she would listen to part of a Bach chorale or a Beethoven symphony. And at first one plays a short catchy part or of the whole work. It should not be a lesson, which is long and serious and makes the children squirm. There's several ways to do this. Karen Angiola found some best of tapes, cassette tapes back when she was homeschooling to introduce her children to great composers music when they were little. It's even easier for us today because you could just go to Spotify or YouTube or Amazon Prime Music, um, Pandora, whatever you use and just type in best of Beethoven, best of Mozart and they will come up with a list for you of some of the very best music of that composer. I have a printable called Best Composers to Study Checklist, which will be in this blog post, so you'll be able to download that at the end here. So when should you listen to this great music? Mrs. McCauley said, how about playing the different parts of the symphony after lunch while the children rest for 15 minutes? You can really listen at any time, especially if it's a classical instrumental piece with no vocals. I think sometimes when they're singing in the music, it can be distracting if the children are doing something like schoolwork uh, that needs a little bit more concentration. But if not, then play the music with vocals too. So here's a couple of ideas of when you can play this great music. During meal times, chores, while you're driving in the car, when you're drawing or painting, during handicraft time, when you're building with Legos, Magformers, or Playmobil, whatever they like to build with, during nap time, bath time, or before naps or beds. So those are some really great times to listen to music, but I would also love to encourage you to find a way to go hear music live. See if there's some children's concerts being put on in your area. Check local libraries because sometimes they have performers come in. Uh, local community colleges or other universities, even public schools like your local high school. And then in the summer, see if there's a summer concert series at a park. Um, check out your city symphony and opera, maybe musical theater in your area, and you'll find some performance ideas. As Mrs. McCauley mentioned above, choose a piece from the program. If you can find out what they're going to be playing or singing on that program, listen to that with your children ahead of time uh, so that they're familiar with it during the performance. That will make it so much more enjoyable for them. And here's another quote that she said, I think that families, schools, and groups should consciously foster richness of musical enjoyment, support concerts and choral singing, both by doing it and going to listen. So the best musical pieces to listen to, I already told you I have a printout that gives you the best composers, but if you are interested in some of the very best musical pieces, I do have um, a blog post called the one, Top 100 Delightful Classical Musical Pieces All Children Should Hear. So you can check that out on this uh, post too when I share it. So if you want to go more in depth with composer study, Mrs. McCauley said grown-ups might go to a local college so that they can take a music appreciation class themselves and expand their own enjoyment. We need to open doors for ourselves so that fresh breezes blow into our lives. That is another thing that Miss uh, Charlotte Mason was so much into was making sure that the mom stays um, strong and keeps learning herself and has time to do these wonderful things for herself to enrich. So that is one thing. I love that idea of going to take a class, a music class. I'm excited to tell you that if this is your desire to take a music appreciation class yourself, you might want to check out the music history courses I've written for high schoolers, which are at a higher level and a lot of moms would love those. So I list a bunch of music appreciation resources that you can help you, but let me just show you a few of them. I love these um, CDs from Maestro Classics. So there's Maestro Classics. And they come with a little activity guide with 
some explanations and different activities inside of it. And if you don't play CDs, they also have MP3s of each, but this one is Tchaikovsky, The Nutcracker. This one is Dukas's The uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice. This is Saint-Saëns, Carnival of the Animals, and Prokofiev, Peter and the Wolf, and there's more too. And I love reading composer books too. There are so many of these in the library. Let me just show you a few. Here's one about Scott Joplin. So just a fun little book about his biography. Here's one, uh, Louis Armstrong, who was a jazz trumpeter and singer. Here's one about Tchaikovsky. And these are really fun books. Old ones reprinted by Zizok. You see that at the top there. Um, all different composers. So this one's about Johann Sebastian Bach. So very fun. Those are some great ideas from about some living books that you can do for composer study. And let me just tell you, I love this quote about how do you determine a book is actually a living book? And this lady, Becky Aniel, said, a living book is a whole narrative beautifully written by an authority with contagious delight in his or her subject, which engages both the mind and the heart, capturing the imagination and inspiring interest in the subject igniting a sense of virtue worthy of imitation and compellingly inviting the reader, both young and old, to read on and on again. So if you have a book that is doing those things, it is most likely a, a living book. So next we are going to talk about him study. I created a course called Great Hymns of the Faith, and it's actually my most popular course ever. And in it, I included several aspects that you can use in addition to simply listening to or hearing, singing a hymn that you're studying. Um, it includes things like the story behind the song and tutorial vid videos to learn how to sing in four-part harmony, devotionals, Bible studies, copy work, and more. And here is a printout of the music from that course. So you'll see that it has, has it in four parts. It has the lyrics. It also has, um, you find a page here. Like this one is the soprano part. And here's the alto part. So you can use Great Hymns of the Faith to do hymn study. And hymn study basically is just learning about hymns, letting your kids learn about the great hymns of the past and even present, um, and all the rich doctrine that's in them, uh, learning how to sing better, learning the poetry of the hymns. So there's so much that comes with doing hymn study. And as I mentioned, you can include um, copy work when you're studying your hymns and that is a great way to do both things for Charlotte Mason. The third way to do music the Charlotte Mason way is to learn about folk songs. Um, Karen Andriola shares this quote that I love about her memories of singing folk songs when she was a child. She said, Facing each other, we sang seemingly endless choruses of American folk songs and patriotic songs. The acts of colorful characters danced in my head for repeated performances. Old Dan Tucker's face was dripping with grease from washing it in a used frying pan. Verses of Liza's bucket with a hole in it began to leak onto my forehead like Chinese water torture. And, the, and outside garbage bins disappeared as I wandered out on the range where the skies were not cloudy all day and beheld the purple mountain's majesty. Do you know the songs that were alluded to in that quote? Do your children. And what culture and what history and what fun they and you are missing out on if you don't. So what exactly is a folk song? A folk song is a song that was transmitted orally, usually with an unknown composer, 
or it was a song that was influenced by that type of traditional song. Music transmitted orally means it was never written down. The people who composed it were people that were not trained in music. They were just everyday people, like a mom who made up a lullaby because she needed to help her baby get to sleep, or a man who wrote a love song for the woman he was trying to woo. It could be a song in a story form written by parents who are trying to teach their children the history of their society or a special event that happened. Or it could be men that wrote made up songs to sing while they were working, like the cattle songs or the sea shanties by sailors. Folk songs were carried down through history and the original composers were forgotten. And eventually the songs did become written down. It was very popular in the early 20th century for composers like actual uh, classical composers to go out into the societies of their own country, out into the country, the folk people, and to find the songs there and record them on phonograph or uh, write them down so that other people could start to learn these. Folk songs are also songs that are inspired by those types of songs. Um, even though we know the composer Stephen Foster's name, he's the one that wrote songs like Camptown Races and Oh Susanna, we still call those folk songs because they're very much similar. And of course, you've probably heard of 1960s American music, folk music, Where Have All the Flowers Gone, If I Had a Hammer, or This Land is Your Land. We call those folk songs too because they are similar in style to the traditional folk songs. So I would encourage you to learn the folk songs of your country. No matter where you live, there will be folk songs. So um, I love this book that Diana Waring wrote, Collecting Folk Songs from America. So in here, it does have a CD so that you have the music to listen to, but she gives you the story, some really great photographs related to the story or whatever's being taught there. Like this one's about the gold rush. And then in the back, it has the music. So this is a really great resource for doing some folk songs with your kids. I also do have a course called a folk song a week. So it gives you 36 folk songs. Let me list off a couple of these. <clears throat> and with that, you get copy work and coloring pages, video of me singing it, a video of like a group singing it or some other um, performer, picture book recommendations, and links to the lyrics and sheet music. But their songs included like all the Pretty Little Horses, Alouetta, Bicycle Built for Two, Buffalo Gals, Danny Bo Boy, De Colores, Down by the Bay, <clears throat> Erie Canal, Follow the Drinking Gourd. So lots of actually 36 different ones there. Um, and there are living books for your folk song studies as well. This is a great way to, I used to read these kinds of books before my kids took naps every day. And this one's nursery rhymes. So of course we don't know who originally wrote the nursery rhymes and some of them you would just chant like Mary, Mary, quite contrary. But other ones have songs that go with it like Polly put the kettle on, Polly put the kettle on and oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clements. So you can find some kinds of books like this that have folk songs in them. Some of them are just one entire song per book like the little drummer boy. This one has uh, illustrations by Ezra Jack Keats. Here's one I love, Hush Little Baby. So fun to, and I would actually sing it, not just read the words. When that star has dropped from view, mama's gonna read a book with you. And then just some resources for some typical old folk songs. This one was a book of my dad's, so I treasure it. It's very old and yellowed, but some great old folk songs in there. You can find some of these We Sing books. You can still find those on Amazon. Lots of different types of these. This one's We Sing in the Car, so you can sing songs like Here's Home on the Range. 
And then this is a really fun book, uh, Treasury of American Folklore and Folk Songs that I have used. I like how this one is chronological, so it starts like, it's American, so it starts with the um, Native American, like poems and songs and stories and myths. And they do have some actual, like here is a cowboy song, Get Along Little Dogies. So we have talked about composer study and hymn study and folk song study. Now we're going to turn to our last three th parts of doing music the Charlotte Mason way, musical creativity, dancing, and some more types of living books. So musical creativity. Susan McCauley said, one offshoot of musical life will be musical creativity. Small children chant their very own songs. Others learning to play the piano will begin to experiment with chords. Those learning, say, the recorder would like to improvise along with a Purcell or Bach record of chamber music. Put out some percussion instruments and encourage the young to accompany records. Accept and admire the products. Let them perform for you. Even the preschool child will delight in singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. So there's two things I'd like to mention about this. First of all, allow creativity and improvisation from your children. There have been many times when I've heard my children messing around on the piano or drum set and it started to drive me crazy. But before I could tell them to be quiet, I would remember this that it was actually a way to practice improvising and an opportunity to express their creativity. So a lot of the times I would just let them continue. Just like you, I want to provide the very best, sorry, just like you'll want to provide the very best products for handicrafts or resources for those, um, have some instruments in your home as well. They don't have to be expensive. You could start with just a simple set of rhythm sticks, shakers, jingles, and a small drum. Let me show you a couple of ideas of simple instruments you can have at home. Rhythm sticks like these. And these are fun because one of them is ridged so you could play a different type of sound when you rub it. Here is a simple sand block. You can even make these with just two pieces of wood and glue sandpaper on. So those are really fun to use. A shaker, you can use those egg shakers. You can make your own egg shakers. Get a plastic Easter egg and put some beans or beads or salt, whatever you want in it to make your own shakers. Little jingles. And then simple hand drums. I really like this kind of hand drum because you can rub it, scratch it. I, because of the, the way the drum faces, um, of course, like that and like play loudly too. And if you have a drum stick, it's even louder. So this is fun to, to create uh, different types of sounds with. Let me show you some other ideas. Move these over. Something like a maraca. If you're studying a particular country, research what instruments they have in that country and see if you can acquire an instrument from that country. So they have some really fun percussion instruments from all over the world. But you can also just start with your <laughs> proverbial pots and, and uh, wooden spoons because those make some fun sounds too. And any kind of bucket, you can do bucket drumming. So I do a lot of these kinds of things in my membership. Uh, some classes to teach bucket drumming and how to use different instruments like those. So that is a great way to encourage creativity. And um, next we will talk about dancing. Mrs. McCauley also said, when there is music, the child responds with dancing. Some music encourages dancing more than others. Children thrive on the atmosphere of joyous, good music, feeling free to dance and skip and sing. 
We found that our family and friends have enjoyed the social aspect of square dancing, English country dances, and Scottish dancing. This gives a happy spice to community life, and it's nice to see six-year-olds mixing happily with mature adults in fun. Teenagers join in, and we are all people together, not segregated into age groups. All four of my daughters love to dance, and all four of my sons have participated to some extent in musical theater as well, which did include dancing. In fact, my husband built a dance studio in our home to facilitate the girls' enjoyment and love of dance. And I would love to give you a tip for how to encourage your children to dance, especially boys if they are not into it, and that's to give them a scarf. If you give them a scarf and then play music that encourages this kind of movement, such as Sasson's The Aviary, you can give them uh, each two scarves so that they can flap their arms like birds, or aquarium, Sasson's Aquarium, and they can pretend to be fish swimming through the aquarium, or um, Schubert's, oh, it just left me. It's something about horses. <laughs> a song that talks about horses and then you use this as your horse tail and you're galloping around and that's a type of dancing too. So I love using scarves to encourage dancing. And we will wrap up today by talking about more types of living books. We did living books for composer study, like composer biographies. We did living books for folk songs, where it would actually have a folk song in it. Um, there's even living books for hymn studies too, where it's telling about the composer or the hymn. But I'd like to tell you a few other ideas that I love for music education. Teaching about instruments, there's some wonderful books out there. This one, as you can see, is getting pretty old. It has a CD that comes with it, and the pages are falling out. But it will teach you about an instrument such as percussion section, and it also teaches about the different eras of music and particular composers like Beethoven, but right here it will tell you which track to play while you're reading those pages in the book. So this is a really fun um, living book to use. This is a great book, uh, Music Is by Stephen T. Johnson, and it's hard for me to show this one because it starts to open up on me because what it does is it teaches you by genres or different styles. There's classical and Latin, uh, jazz, and of course there's etc. But what's fun about this book is it actually ooh, completely opens up like that. <laughs> and then on the back of it, the backs of the pages, it gives you more instructions information about that style and some specific pieces that you can listen to like examples of electronica music. So let me see if I can fold this one back up but this is a super fun book for kids to play around with and read. Music is. Then there are books that are about specific pieces of music like this one is about the Nutcracker, the ballet by Tchaikovsky. And so this will tell the story of the Nutcracker and then it's fun to listen to the music while you're looking at the pictures in a beautiful book like this. There's lots of Nutcracker versions. And then this is one for Peter and the Wolf. That I love this music because it's narration with the music and so you're learning about instruments because the flute is the character of the bird, and the oboe is the character of the duck, the bassoon is the grandfather, and so as you're going through the story and you're hearing the music play, you hear those instruments. All right, I believe I am at the end. I have told you six different wonderful ways to do Charlotte Mason method of music education, composer study, folk songs, and hymn study and musical creativity, dancing, and lots of living books. And you can find all these resources at musicinourhomeschool.com slash charlotte mason music. 
So again, my name is Gina Mayo. Please reach out to me if you have any questions and I would love to answer them for you. Bye-bye.